Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at the Strain. Before we launch into a discussion of Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon, I'd like to share a little bit of history about the Strain. The Strain was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 93 years, the Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Whiter. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors like James Hibbard, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so appreciative of it. So, tonight we are beyond excited to have with us James Hibbard to celebrate the release of Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon, Game of Thrones, and the official untold story of the epic series. James is an award-winning entertainment journalist who has written thousands of stories covering the business of Hollywood across nearly two decades. He's currently an editor-at-large at Entertainment Weekly and was previously the TV editor at The Hollywood Reporter. Prior to covering entertainment, he made headlines in 2001 as a staff writer at Phoenix News Times, where he risked imprisonment amid a legal battle versus county and federal authorities in order to protect a confidential source and lawn. His freelance work has appeared in the New York Times, Salon, Cosmopolitan, Details, and the best American sports writing. He lives in Austin, Texas. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming... James. Hi, James. Hey, thank you so How much you for doing, having James? me. I'm so excited to be here. Good. We're thrilled. So I imagine it's been a crazy week for you launching the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, as, especially as, as a first time author going into this uh, and as a journalist, you know, all I do every day is interview other people. So to be on the other side of a publicity tour and and to uh, be on the other side of, of that whole machine has been, you know, sort of uh, sort of fascinating. So it's 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 been quite a trip. Oh, I'm sure it's got to be completely different, particularly if you just compiled a giant oral history of the TV show Game of Thrones where you're just interviewing people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's 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 been quite a quite a process. And, you know, you know I started on on this back in uh, this journey back in, in 2008. So so to sort of end it uh, now, 12 years later, has has been uh been pretty, pretty it's been pr pretty amazing and it's it's been you know easily the most interesting thing i've ever covered in my life well, well I, that would be a great place i think to start and sort of welcome viewers into is maybe you could share a bit of history about your journey with game of thrones because in sure the Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I first broke the news of the pilot when I was at Hollywood Reporter in 2008. And uh, you know, the showrunners, David Benioff and Dan Weiss, jumped on the phone for a few minutes to talk about their show. And they basically talked, they, what they said to me was basically what they said to HBO. They sort of gave a very short version of their HBO pitch. And like HBO, I was kind of intrigued. I was like, this sounds really cool. It sounds like something I might like want to watch. So I picked up one of the books and I think I tore through the first three books and in like a few weeks, I was like, this is amazing. This is fantastic. Uh, but nobody can actually make these books into a TV show. This is impossible. I can't believe they're actually trying to do this, but if they actually pull it off, uh, it will change television history easily. And if they don't pull it off, it's going to be this massive face plant. And either way, as, as, as a reporter, that's that, that, that makes a great story. So I immediately started uh, trying to uh, cover it more. And then I moved to Entertainment Weekly, where uh, they often do set visits for t TV shows. And I, you know, even in my hiring interview in early 2011, before the show debuted, I was like, I really want to cover Game of Thrones. And so uh, I would go to the set and, uh, over the years, fewer and fewer people were kind of allowed on the sets. It got more and more secretive. And one thing I think that the producers appreciated about my coverage was that most people were very interested in spoilers. They're very spoiler focused and the producers absolutely hate spoilers. That's the one thing, you know, even the you know, stuff that's already been in the books, they didn't want out there because if you didn't re re read the books, you don't know. So. And just as a fan of entertainment, I don't personally like spoilers. I, I like to know, you know, as little as possible in, in some respects when I go into a movie about the plot. So 
you know, that's something I never really put in my coverage because, you know, I didn't want to spoil that for others. So in that way, we were, we were on the same page. And so uh, I think in the, well, there on the second season, I found out through a crew member that Jason Momoa was, was coming back for, for this cameo appearance. And that was like this big top secret thing. And they're all worried I'd report it. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to ruin that for fans. So, uh, you know, I, I've always been more interested in the creative process and and how things get made and the drama of that. And then after something airs, then I want to talk about the spoilers and what it means and, and break that down uh, after fans have had time to see it. So uh, that's, 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 that's sort of the short version of, of my history with the, uh, the show. Well, that, so one of the like interesting points you sort of brought up was like uh, when you were discussing the fact that you had initially interviewed the showrunners and that was the beginning of it where mm -hmm. that excitement was born. I found all of the interviews with sort of HBO execs about sort of going for the show and deciding to run with it fascinating, yeah. particularly because they were both first time showrunners. Right. Like, I think, right. Yeah. So how, how did they sell people on the idea of this giant expensive show? Well, you know, it, it's it, it's 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 funny because you know they had experience writing books and and writing movies, but not TV. And you know, one thing that's one thing that that's been uh, that's been used as, as a bit a bit of a criticism of, of the showrunners is was well, they, they didn't even have any experience, but it, it it was also the reason they were able to do it. Uh, oddly enough, because because uh, with everybody had been pitching George R. R. Martin. Uh, adapting his books and they were pitching him on doing a movie and he was like well it, you know if we do it as a series of movies what if the first one doesn't work then the whole thing's broken and, and or they'd do it they'd want to do it but they'd say well let's just get rid of half the characters and <laughs> and and focus it down and make this manageable and he would say no and when when david and dan came along they were they they said no we want to do it like the books we want to keep the characters we want to do it long form we and we want to do it you know not for a broadcast network or or ad supported network where you have to cut out all the sex and violence and profanity you know we want to make it as close, close to the books as we can and so and they were the first ones to sort of come up with that but here's the thing a person with actual television experience would never have wanted to do that because it, because it was such an impossible thing to do, uh, you know. And they didn't know that, so they went into this and they kind of pitched this, and and they didn't even kind of realize what they were getting into. And then once they had to do it, they had to figure out how to do it. So so you know, their in, in a way, their lack of experience made them you know not know that they weren't supposed to be able to do this and then they had to pull it off that's that's fascinating because you would assume not knowing would be a barrier to actually right exactly making the show, but yeah. no it opened doors yeah i mean though though at first it was a barrier because obviously you know the, the first pilot uh was was a disaster and you know and there's a lot of chaos on, on the set of the first season as they figured out how to do it but we have one thing that a HBO executive is quoted on because I asked her point blank. I'm like, you know, these, these guys were first time showrunners, you know, especially af after, you know, you know, the first pilot failed, you know, you know, why did you, you know, what, what made you trust them? And they said, you know, sometimes we, when someone brings this idea, we go out and get a more experienced person to run the show. Um, they said with David and Dan throughout the development process, which is like years, basically, Every time they would bring in somebody who was really experienced, who was like a department head, like like a head, head of production or or, or, or or cinematographer or whatnot, they would have conversations with them, and the people coming in would have very conventional approaches. And what David and Dan off usually had a different idea, and the executives kept thinking, you know what, the idea that these newbies have is better than the conventional approach. So they kept kind of earning their trust behind the scenes that that they knew creatively what to do. Well, so the next question would be then, how did they convince George R. R. Martin that they knew what they were doing? Or <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think George had been pitched by a lot of people who were familiar with his books, but didn't really know them, didn't really know them truly, you know, front to back, like, like, like you would want, want somebody to. So, you know, they talked a lot about the books themselves and showed in that lunch meeting 
you know, that they had a deep knowledge of what was going on. And, and, uh, and of course there was the infamous, uh, ending of their lunch where after hours of this, you know, meeting, uh, George pops the, the question on him, who is Jon Snow's mother, which at the time was this big mystery in the books. There were plenty of fan theories, but nobody knew. And as it just so happens, the night before the showrunners had talked about that and kind of came up with their own theory, which as it turned out, just happened to be right. And then while we're sort of discussing the relationship with George, one of the like uh, one of the chapters I found most interesting was about the sort of split around mm. season five. The divorce chapter, yes. Yeah, if you could talk a bit about that, I think it would be fascinating for fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, I mean, it's it would serve an am, uh, amicable divorce. A, a chapter title, uh, "The Forks in the Road," you know, which is based off a, a quote by by from I think I think, I think it's from from David Benioff, basically saying, you know, you, you know, whenever there's a fork in the road between the books and the show, and you know, we have to choose between you know sticking with what, what with what's in, in the books versus what's better for the show, we're always going to choose what's better for the show, and. Yeah, it's it was interesting because a lot of it was based on on an assumption. Um, George assumed that the producers would spend just as long adapting uh, a Feast for Crows and a Dance with D Dragons as they had spent on the previous books because the, the, both his fourth and fifth books are 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 are, are huge books. And but in those books, he introduced all these new characters and storylines that George finds very integral to the story. But for Dan and David, um, they had already reached a point in season five where they had eight major storylines, 30 series regulars, and were having to bench characters like Bran and the Hound for whole seasons. And even their major actors who were, there, who were being paid quite a bit of money were only, you know, sometimes only had a few minutes of screen time. So basically, they sort of reached the limit in terms of a, of a television production in terms of what you could do. And... So, so, so they really had to to figure out how do we keep the show going and, and how do we end it with with the, mainly using the pieces we already have on the board. So even if the books were out, you know, even if the books were out, you know, I think the show would have would have taken a different path. But you know, and also the books weren't out. You know, um, George gave them the rough draft idea of what they were what he was planning, but, you know, ultimately they had to kind of figure out, well, what's, what makes sense uh, best for the show. And look, so to like touch on the ending though, are you able to share with us how much of the show's ending rang true with what George R. R. Martin had planned, or at least in terms of like the characters endings, like Sansa? I mean, not really. There's there are three major things, like uh, three infant. You know, this, this is sort of the fabled three things that uh, George told them that ended up, you know, you know, in the show. And that is um, uh, Sanus uh, Baratheon burning his daughter. Um, it was uh, the fate of Hodor and the origin of his name. And uh, and also, as George put it, you know, you know, you know, you know who ends up on the Iron Throne, which and. As the showrunners put it, something at the very end. So presumably that means Bran mm -hmm. Stark also ends up in the Iron, Iron Throne. But I'm, I'm only kind of phrasing it weird just because I'm being very ex exact, just in case everyone's being very tricky. So, so as, as a reporter, you're always looking for, for like uh, weasel wording where it's like, well, that could mean two different things. But presumably that, that that's what he meant. Um, and George has said uh, in interviews that uh, that uh, that there will be major differences between the books and the show, and, and then of course people will um, have their reactions to that, and then the, the the debate will will start all over again. I'm sure every single fan is fixated on what will happen to Daenerys at the end of the book. Like, I'm yes, sure that that's that's a big question now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so. In, when you were conducting all of these interviews since 2008, did you have any idea this would become a book? No, 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 no. In, in, in fact, uh, as the final season was was airing, my big thought was, boy, I can't wait to never write about Game of Thrones again. I, I had been <laughs> doing so many Game of Thrones stories. I, I was telling friends, I'm like, just typing the words Game of Thrones at this point, I'm just done. But 
then a, a literary agent reached out to me and pitched the idea of doing, uh, you know, you know, the making of Game of Thrones is oral history. I'm like, oh no, that, I'm like, oh no, that's a good idea. And then I started thinking about, you yeah. know, the, a the fact that all my pieces for uh, Entertainment Weekly, you know, they're, they're very specific. You know, it's very much about a scene or a performance or a season preview. There's nothing that tells it the, the whole story from beginning to end. And the idea of creating something permanent, you know, it, or at least as permanent as, as books can be, um, you know, that told the whole story suddenly sounded really intriguing. And then I started thinking even more about weight. You know, those early seasons, I, I did you know some good reporting, but it wasn't nearly as intensive as the later seasons when it became like a web traffic monster, and I was able to sort of you know you know justify uh, staying on the set for longer and and doing more stories. So there was all these things that I wanted to kind of fill out from those early meetings that, that you talked about to the, you know, the scrapped pilot to the first season to the first battle. Um, and there was also many controversial points about the show along the way where um, it, there were things that the people involved in the show found sensitive and didn't want to talk about them on record at the time. But after the show ended, they were more open to talking about things like the uh, like the Dorn storyline, you know, which which is a storyline that, that fans a lot of fans didn't particularly, particularly care for, and and kind of ended you know a bit early and abruptly. So you know, there's there's uh, and so I so it gave me an opportunity to go back and kind of revisit all those things as well. And then the goal of the book became, yeah, of course, because I always set like the hardest possible goal. You know, the goal of the book became, I want to use as much new reporting as possible. It's like, I have, yes, I have this archive of old quotes, but I want to be as new as possible and and to kind of read like a bit like a page turner. I don't want to be like an encyclopedia of making Game of Thrones. I want it to read, mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to put entertaining the reader as like the first job so so that you're just kind of going through it and one of the most gratifying things since the book came out is getting messages like you know i finished your book in two days you know and and uh, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know there was even someone who like was upset about something in the book and screenshot it and sent it to me like at midday tuesday and i was like <laughs> well, well you're upset about that but that's chapter 16 which means you read 16 page 16 chapters since this morning so 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 the book must be pretty good if you're reading that much that fast so <laughs> so so that that's that you know that's been re really gratifying because game of thrones as a brand it's such a you know iconic brand and i wanted to do something that 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 kind of felt you know worthy of the brand well, was it a difficult shift going from sort of short form articles or interviews to writing a book, which is what, 450, 460 pages? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, was, it was funny because at first all the chapters were coming in around like 2000 words. And I realized, wait, that's how long an EW cover story is. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like I'm programmed to sort of think of, of 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 chap chapters or, or or a story as about that length, and that was very early in the process. And now they range anywhere from like fifteen hundred words to like like eight thousand words. But um, and the other thing was is that when I made the book deal, it was for a hundred thousand words, you know, which is like probably like a little under three hundred pages. And I'm like, oh my god, how am I going to write a hundred thousand words? And you know, you know, within a year, and I got my full time job to do. How am I going to be able to do this? And then I ended up writing 150,000 words and it became like this 450 page book. And I could have kept going. I, I, if I had another six months, it would have been a longer book, but I don't know that it would have been a better one because mm -hmm. you know, at some point you have to just kind of stop and, 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 and cut it off. And what's interesting about Game of Thrones and writing about the world of Game of Thrones is there's something about the world of Game of Thrones that lends itself to endless expansion. And this is something that George R. R. Martin has found writing it and, and the showrunners wrestled with is that the world is so big, there's so much to it, there's always more to do. And I started to feel, you know, in those final months, like Indiana Jones in, in, in The Last Crusade when he's reaching for the Holy Grail. And, and, and he's like, you know, you know I, I can almost reach it. I can almost reach it. And that's kind of how I felt all the time. It's like, uh, you know, if I only get one more interview, if I only, you know, add one more scene. If I only polish this one more time, it'll be better. And then you just realize that, you know, you know, 
you're never going to get get the, uh, the 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 damn cup anyway. Yeah, you know, you know, it, it's always it's always going to be out of reach, right? So you know, so so then you stop and you hope, you know, you know that that I've 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 uh, I've done it and and it's good and that people like it. Yeah, that's true. And during that like research process of having to do new interviews, mm -hmm. did it change how you thought about say any of the things you had seen on set? or any of the like stories or interviews you had filed earlier? I'm sure, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to pull out, pull out an example because there's just, you know, so much, so much in there. Um, you know, I do think one, you know, to use something that that's already out there, um, you know, you know I, I do love the Diana Riggs stories because that was one thing that nobody ever mentioned on on set. And then after the, the show aired, they just kind of unloaded on all these, you know, really funny <laughs> Diana Riggs stories. And I think people always like it when when actors are are a little bit like their characters. And you know, these stories of, of her being you know very obstinate and 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 bossy and 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 and, and firm with people. Um, you know, and storming off the set at one point, you know, I, 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 I thought that, that, that stuff was great and, and, and just really fun. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, there's, yeah. So there's, there's, there's constantly stuff where, where, you know, it was filling in little details here, here, here's another like little detail. Like there's, um, the you know in the red wedding, one of my favorite moments of that, I think it's one of my favorite bits of acting in the entire series is the moment uh, that Caitlin, uh, you know, that, that, that ruse that Caitlin starts to get suspicious and she looks over at ruse, yeah. ruse Bolton and he, he sort of gl glances down at his sleeve and she pulls it off and, and she sees that he's wearing chain mail uh, uh, under it. And she realizes, you know, what's about to happen and they're all in danger. And the look that Ruse Bolton gives her in that moment is just this amazing look. And the actor was talking uh, in the interview about how, yeah, I didn't want to do that. The, the director had to drag that out of me. And one of the producers said that it, it reminded him of of like the story in Jaws where where they talk about the shark and the doll's eyes rolling up that kind of animalistic look. And that's exactly that's exactly right. That's exactly what it was like. And uh, the director, David Nutter, came over, told me, he goes, look, look, you know, I don't want subtlety. I want melodrama. You, you, you know, you know I, I, I want you to go for it. And um, so, you know, there's there's lots of moments like that. And that actually gives me goosebumps because I just thought that scene was so great. Yeah. Oh, my God. That scene yeah. was yeah. heartbreaking. Just yeah. like, oh. But so then out of all of your interviews, do you have a favorite interviewee or favorite interview you did? Um, well, for the book specifically, my favorite interview was George. Um, we uh, talked for hours at his uh, favorite restaurant in Santa Fe. And uh, he was, you know, he was, uh, when you read the book, his, you, you kind of never know which direction he's going to go on something. Because sometimes he's really, you know, hugely praises something the show did. Sometimes he's very critical of something the show did. And, but he, so, so, but he's always really candid. Plus, George's journey with the show is very emotionally complex, you know, obviously. And, and his interview reflects that too. And also, you know, he gave, he gives like lots of little bits of history because he's such a history buff talking about the, the historical origins for some of the things in the show. And, and I, I, I kind of liked, you know, having, you know, getting some of those bits of detail in there too, you know, because I, help, I think it helps ground it. So, yeah. So for the book, um, he was my favorite interview, you know, just in general, um, I tend to like, like it when I interview actors, when you read their quotes afterward and you can hear the voice of the actor. And, uh, you know, uh, Amelia Clark and Gwendolyn Christie and Kit Harrington are, are like three examples of when you read their quotes in the page, it's almost like like hearing an audiobook because they're, they're so distinctive and their personality just kind of shines through. Oh, there was... Some uh, scene you described where you were on set watching uh, Kit Harrington in a fight, and then I believe he's like quoted as saying something along the lines of like "fame and glory." They told me fame and glory. Yeah. Just getting bloody and knocked around. Yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah. 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 I can hear the distinctive. Yeah, yeah, and and just yeah, watching the Battle of the Bastards was one of my couple top peak Game of Thrones experience. I just remember sitting there 
and uh, or standing there rather, and just seeing it play out in front of me, and it fills your field of vision, and you have all these people in all in all in all these uh, costumes, and their swords are clashing, and they're screaming their heads off, like, and there's flames, and there's a body pile. And there are moments because of the way the way because you can be in a position where the where the production is all behind you, where you feel like you're there. You know, you know, there, there's nothing in the field of vision that 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 tells you that you're on a set. You know, there's not like some big green screen like in a Marvel movie or or, or, or something. And oh. you you feel this transported feeling uh, and 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 this sense of like raw like barbarism going on that uh that is just i mean you know it's 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 pretty incredible to watch all those audience what was your favorite scene to have seen on set that would definitely be the purple wedding because um uh you know joffrey's death and and the whole and everything that led up to it um you know, partly because uh, it's an iconic scene from the books. It's it's such a great scene in the books. It's, you know, it's a terrific chapter uh, when that goes down. And uh, so to see that brought to life was amazing. Plus, it, it was one of those very rare occasions where you have a large group of the cast all in the same scene together. Plus, it was a beautiful day in Dubrovnik. And uh, most of the time you're on set on Game of Thrones, you're wet and cold and miserable. So that was rare. And just because of the staging, they're all up on this kind of slightly elevated platform and they're all kind of facing outward on this table. So when the camera was in the position of where, you know, the guests were, you know, facing that table, you could sort of stand next to the camera and it's basically like watching a play. It was basically like watching a, like a window into a play, uh, you know, you know, showing this huge pivotal event in, in Westeros. Plus of course, just seeing Joffrey Baratheon, you know, die over and over again, take for take after take was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Well, was it, did it change your sort of experience as a viewer and a fan of the show getting to see it filmed? Like, did it negatively impact you when watching the show, I guess would be the Totally. Best. Yeah, totally. It's, it, it, I mean, it's, I mean, look, getting to cover the show was, was, was a huge, huge privilege. I'm, I'm just like so glad I got to do it. But the one bad thing is that, you know, it's, your favorite show and every episode is is ruined to some degree, which is always why I struggle and give annoying answers when people are like, well, what did you think of this episode? Or what did you think of this? It's like, well, you know, I knew what happened in advance. I saw part of it being shot. I was, I was working on my EW recap and taking notes while it aired. How, you know, it's, it's so, so when it comes to, you know, looking at the show from a TV critic perspective, like, I mean, I, what I always say is, is like the average fan has a more accurate read on how the episodes played than I did because they were watching it presumably not knowing what was going to happen. They were just relaxing and enjoying it, whereas I'm like, you know, frantically mm -hmm. blogging away. Well, did did you find it was difficult to be both like a critic of the show and to operate behind the scenes and ask for these interviews? Like we're were there any instances of tension or was it all just sort of smooth sailing? Well, I mean, I, I, I did the EW's recaps, which aren't really the same as reviews, but they, but they were very snarky. I mean, because I, I basically made fun of every single episode of, of, of the show. And I, you know, a lot of the times I would, you know, push publish on that. I'm like, well, you know, that that's the last time I'm getting back on that set. <laughs> you know? And and I also covered, um, you know, all, all of the controversies, you know, that, that would happen on, on the show too, you know, for, from, from more of a news perspective for the site. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, but, you know, one thing I, I, I didn't do is, is, is I did, and I, this is just my writing across the board is, is I don't take uh, cheap shots and, and I don't, make assumptions about somebody's motives it's like it's like you can say okay this is bad that this happened and this didn't work or whatever but i don't like go take it to the next step of you know this is because you know this person's a terrible person you know so you know and and i think that's just something that's serving you know very common social media and and unfortunately serve increasingly common in in, in a lot of press coverage nowadays it very much is uh, fandoms are are an interesting sort of phenomenon we're experiencing <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So one of the things, speaking of sort of the fun of being on the set, that like gets thrown down through the rumor mill is what sort of pranksters David and Dan are. I'm curious <laughs> if like 
any fun pranks showed up in your interviews? If there was anything which caught your eye or caught your ear? Yeah, there's there's uh, there's at least one that that's that that I'm that is like so off the record I, I I can't even talk about. But um there's uh there there are some new ones in 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 the books, including um one where where they told uh Maisie and Sophie when they were shooting the original pilot that because they were underage, they wouldn't be allowed to go to the rap party with the rest of the cast. And instead they would have their own rap party at McDonald's and it made them cry. So yes, yes. And, and that of course, you know, had, you know, got quite a reaction on social media, you know, Game of Thrones showrunners made, you know, Maisie and Sophie cry when they were 13, you know, is, you know, so, um, it, it, and, uh, you know, there's also one that they, that, uh, they, you know, and, and, and yeah, there's, 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 there's quite a few in there that, that are that, but it, it, one thing that it, they're almost all like early season, um, uh, ones too, because you know they they sort of got to a point where a everything just got so serious and so intense on set in terms of what they were trying to do, and because people just stopped believing the showrunners when they would like try to give them fake scripts and stuff. <laughs> well, it makes sense that they'd eventually adapt. Yeah. So, in terms of being on the set itself, I think. If you could give us sort of a view of like what it's like as a just like a person unaffiliated with the show to just see that magic happen. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's you know that's that's a good question. I mean, it's what's interesting is that I go to a lot of TV and movie sets and most of them, well, pretty much all of them are not like Game of Thrones because there's a sort of uh, impression that movie and TV sets are, are, are very, you know, comfy places. You know, you, you, have, you have actors lounging in nice trailers, you have production assistants, you know, bringing you food, you know, you play something dramatic on camera and then everything's like, you know, easy and comfortable as, as, as soon as, as, as things pull back and you realize, oh, okay, they weren't in any real danger or whatever. Game of Thrones, it was like, I mean, it, I mean, people, so, you know, so some of the things that, that people had to go through were so physically demanding, um, you know, shooting the final season took, uh, there, there are people that, that felt like they, they, that took six months to recover from shooting that, like, because like, there was like the long night battle where it was 55 consecutive night shoots, you know, where people are working up till, you know, mm. you know, you know, four, you know, four, four o'clock in the morning and it's freezing and there's like two polar vortex storms that rolled through and you're, you're dealing in wind and rain and you're cold and wet and miserable. And you haven't seen like, like the sun for, for, for a month. And it just broke people down. And so what you had is you had a group of, of people that didn't just have to do their jobs you know, and didn't just have to perform or, or, or you know, serve as crew members, they had to become athletes. They had to become like, like these, like these, like, like ultra marathoners, uh, where, where you're doing these extremely intense physical, you know, a acts where you're, you're, you're just breaking yourself down and, and still having to kind of perform at the level that a show like Game of Thrones demands in terms of, of your normal job as well. Was the crew in love with the show too? Like, yes. Did they? They were just easily. Yeah. No. I mean, this was a passion project for every, every, everybody involved. I mean, it, it was it was an extremely you know it's 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 interesting because it's you know the show's been over for a year. There's been a lot a lot of criticisms of the show, but if you look around, you don't see people coming out and and kind of like like bashing it who who worked on it. It was a very tight knit tight knit group you know it was it was a very close group and and they all felt like they, they went through this like you know 10-year war together and, and and they're all they're all veterans of of of, of that war and, and they have a bit of a bond were there any sort of juicy interpersonal like bits which came up in interviews about the actors relationships with each other that you assume fans are going to get really excited about in the book uh, let's see, let's see, nothing that I would share, Not, nothing I, I, I would share on that. But, uh, but you know, I mean, one, one sort of, sort of, sort of harmless thing is, um, 
I, you know, I really love uh, the chapter on Jamie and Bran uh, because Nikolai and Gwendolyn's relationship is is you know has an element. They're they're very different from their characters, but there's an element to their relationship that uh, that reflects the sort of you know savage teasing with underlying respect thing that Jamie and Brienne have. And there's this great um, you know stretch where both of them tell their own version of what it was like when they first met, and uh, you know Nikolai was was rather rude and and and. and and uh, Gwen was all stunned and upset, and then she started pushing back on him, and then they kind of fell into this pattern of of just completely uh, ripping on each other, which is also kind of what happens, you know, to some degree in the show, and mm -hmm. uh, and and kind of learn to work with each other, and then you go the set years later, and they're still doing that. So, um, the, you, know, the, you, know, the, you know, that's a little fun. Oh, and so which actor? With would you say is closest to their character and in personality, and which one would you say is sort of farthest from their character? Um, um, let's see. Uh, I would say, hmm. Let me think. Think about that. Um, I am. I am. Uh, huh. That's tricky. That's tricky. I mean, I, definitely the, the, the one that's furthest from it is Lena Headey because Lena is absolutely nothing like like uh, Cersei Lannister. I mean, she is 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 this really sort sort of you know you know you know down to earth you know you know you know you know, you know very fun you know sort of you know uh, sort of more. You know, you know, you know, earthy person that uh, you know, and even you know, in terms of her her looks, I mean, sure, you know, she has, she has like you know, shorter dark hair. She has like a ton of tattoos that get covered up. I mean, yeah, I mean, she she utterly transforms. I I, I, I would say. Uh, what do you think fans are going to find most sort of exciting in the book? Like, uh, what tidbits do you think, or do you expect them to sort of rally around and talk about? Um, oh, there's, 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 there's so much and, and there's so much that's sort of coming out right now, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, it's, this is a book that I knew would be mined for scoops the moment it came out and I knew publications would start like posting little tidbits from it. And, you know, I tried very hard to write it so that it's it, that it, it stands as a reading experience, even if you've already, you know, already read those things online. So, so it's not so much about the scoops; it's about the sort, sort of the collective journey that that you take. Like, for instance, for 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 the final season, um, there's about six chapters that touch on the final season, and that 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 break that down. And I think you know whether you love the final season or whether you hate the final season you know what's undeniable is that it's that it was you know the story behind making it is completely fascinating um mm -hmm. and uh and you know all those decisions that were so pivotal and why they were made and what it was like to do it and you can kind of follow along and go and decide for yourself well okay i can see why they made that decision but i would have done it differently or or or, or whatnot and kind of come to your own conclusion about things so i mean I, I i think it's more about the journey than any specific scoop per se okay no, that makes sense because it does read compellingly mm -hmm. like even just when you're talking about just sort of changes in staffing like hbo execs switching over it's like, yeah what what, will this get made? What's going to happen next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's, there, there's so much uncertainty, you know, in those early days. I mean, everyone looks back at this and thinks of it as so inevitable because everything looks inevitable in, in, in retrospect, right? And uh, you know, some are like, oh, well, you know, these, these, these two showrunners were handed this big show. It's like, well, no, nobody wanted this show. <laughs> you know, every, everybody, you know, you know, this was something that was willed into existence and and should have happened should not have happened in in so many ways and um you know and you know and everything i always find interesting is is how you know when they sh sold the show to hbo they, they 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 basically confessed that that they lied when talking to hbo they made it sound like this is not like a show that's going to have lots of big battles you know it's about 
it's just about characters. You know, it's a very much a chamber piece, not an orchestra. And that was completely untrue because if you read the books, you know, there's these massive battles with multiple armies and thousands, tens of thousands of people. And it, they knew that in order to do the show that they wanted to do, they would have to make the show into such a massive hit that HBO would have no choice but to give them the money that they would need to do it. Which is, I mean, it's hard to understate what a bonkers move that is because basically it's like, you're not only doing a TV show, you have to make the show into like, as one actor put it, you know, they had to make the show into the biggest show in the world in order to make it, you know? So, so they had to keep leveling up to such a degree so that by the time that you got to those battles that that they actually were able to do them. Otherwise, you know, the, the show, you know, for many reasons, there, 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 there are many points along the way where things could have gone wrong. And, you know, there are many points that people, you know, do think that that, uh, that, that things went wrong, but it's, it's, it's difficult to understate how many, you know, billions of decisions were right in order for it to become what it did first. Then, so before we turn over to audience questions, I'm going to sure. ask you one last one, which is, is your journey, like once you're done with this book tour, do you think your journey with Game of Thrones is done? Or do you plan like to follow the sort of like prequel series, the spinoffs, get into it? I mean, I definitely feel like my, I've, I've, I'm done covering Game of Thrones, you know, that show, the prequel show, you know, it, it's, it's so Godfather three. It's, 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 it's so, you know, just when I think I'm, I'm out, they, they, they pulled me back in, you know, they, they announced the, 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 the first pilot. And I was like, eh, I don't know about the idea. You know, I, I don't know if I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how that's going to work. That doesn't, doesn't sound that great. And then they scrapped that idea and then they announced House of the Dragon. I was like, oh shit. Because because that, you know, the story of the Dance of Dragons and uh, you know, you know, and the Targaryen, you know, obviously the the Targaryen Civil War. And then they hired Miguel Sapochnik uh, as co-showrunner. And Miguel Sapochnik, of course, of course, directed some of the best episodes of Game of Thrones, including the Battle of the Bastards and the Winds of Winter. And he is just a beast. I mean, like, you know, you, you talk about re revelations from the book, like more just a teeny detail, you know, when he was working on Battle of the Bastards, it was so intense that he would only allow himself to take one pee break per day, <laughs> you know, which, which, which is to me just mind blowing that, 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 that he would be working on his feet, running around all day and only, and only allow himself one pee break all day, you know? And, and so, and now he's, in you know uh you know in the co-showrunner chair and he's such a visionary director and so talented that i'm very curious to see what he does with uh with uh with with house of the dragon now that he's calling the shots oh, yeah, it'll be fascinating now let's turn it over to our audience question sure. okay so our first question is from facebook and asks you mentioned that you were always very respectful of spoilers. Were there any bombshells that tested mm -hmm. even your willpower not to discuss? <laughs> uh, yes, there were. There, 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 there were definitely some times. I mean, basically, when I would write my preseason story, there was always this kind of push and pull in my head because it's like you want to tease the season. You want to give people a sense of what's to come, but you don't want to spoil it. So you're, you're always kind of debating with yourself, you know, how far do you, do you go? I, I, I remember once, you know, you, you know, I, I teased uh, Sir, Sir Barristan's death uh, and I, I say, you know, I, I, I phrased it something like, you know, a, a liked character from the books who's still alive in the books will, will, will meet their end without naming him. You know, they, mm. that, that was sort of a way of kind of half doing it. <clears throat> the, the, the biggest test was, and this wasn't something I wanted to reveal, but it was just very hard to keep to myself, was learning that Jon Snow kills Daenerys, which by the way, is something that still is difficult for me to say because I heard about that on the Game of Thrones season eight set and then spent a year keeping that to myself when oh my when everybody wanted to talk to, to me about the final season of Game of Thrones. And so there wasn't a day that went by that somebody didn't want to have a conversation with me about it. And 
all through the conversation, pinging around my brain is John Kiltonaris, John Kiltonaris, John Kiltonaris. <laughs> don't don't say that, John Kiltonaris. <laughs> you know, and so that was like a, a year of like, mm, <laughs> you know, just trying to keep that uh, under wraps because I was always so terrified that I would you know blurt something out and then suddenly you know I'm the one who who, who spoiled it, spoiled everything. You know, to quote Sansa. <laughs> Well, all right. Our next question is, you always maintained a fine line between writing for fans who have read the books and for fans who haven't read the books. Mm -hmm. How did you strike that balance? Hmm. You know, I, I, I think that I... I, for the most part, just really tried to focus on, you know, what does the average fan want to know and, and what, you know, is, 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 is crucial and important and just try, try, try to focus on that. And it was, it was always very, very, very context uh, specific and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and tried to get a, get a sense of that, you know, I, I always felt like, you know, it, it's it's interesting that the, that that person said that because I always kind of worried that I was underserving the 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 book readers to 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 some extent because because they 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 have you know they have you know their own sort of views and their own sort of questions and and I always try to try to strike that balance so 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 thank thank you for saying that I did that because I sometimes felt like like I was too show focused so I appreciate that. Was it sort of tricky to? keep out your sort of foreknowledge from having read the books from like filtering into the like recaps or reviews themselves um you know it, it was sometimes what was tricky wasn't so much that from the books but once i i had been going to the set and so i'd have to recap an episode and kind of play dumb to some extent and try and play like you know um whoops uh that uh that uh, you know, I I would, I would have to kind of you know explore the drama of certain scenes that are clearly leading to something, but not kind of tip what they're leading to at at, at, at the same time. So I, I was I, I was always you know slightly paranoid when I was writing my recaps because I was trying to put myself in the framework uh, mental framework of all I know is what's in that episode. If all I know is what's in that episode, what would I be thinking and assuming at this point? Yep, yeah, that makes perfect sense because you don't want to. Well, again, you don't want to spoil anything for anyone. Yeah. So our next question is: What did you think of the liberties taken with the plot in the show when compared to the book's source material? You know, it's like when I would hear reasons for doing it, I, I always understood the reasons. I mean, Dan and David are, are, are very sort of hyper logical, uh, you know, people, and they're always sort of looking at it for, from a TV standpoint and, and from a production standpoint. And you know, there I have a chapter in there that's that's devoted to uh, Sansa Stark's wedding night and the fallout of that, which is you know obviously you know, you know a short moment, but I thought it was very important to to suspend an entire chapter on that. It's 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 the most important scene or I'm sorry, it's the most uh, controversial scene uh, in, in the show. And it led to a broader discussion about, uh, sexual assault in television shows that I thought was very important. So, um, you know, and, and it's, and it's interesting because, uh, uh, you know, George in that, you know, very firmly states, you know, my little finger never would have done that. You know, he, 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 mm -hmm. never would have, would have, uh, turned over, uh, Sansa Stark to, 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 to Ramsey. And, and, you know, and, and I, I think he makes a good case for, for why, Little finger wouldn't have done that, but then you hear, you know, the showrunners go, "Look, look in in the books, the person who marries Ramsay is this unknown uh, or very little known character, and we wanted to give that role to one of our major actors. And our little finger is not the same as the, as the book's little finger. You know, he you know, he he operates differently. So, you know, I, you know, one thing I always try to do in in all my reporting is to try to see things to try to get my own opinions out of the way." and try to see things from the point of view of the person I'm interviewing and try to get their point of view across so that people can make up their own minds. Hi. Hi. So our next question is about the editing process and goes, <laughs> what did you want to include in the book that you couldn't do to your editor or due to your own judgment? Okay, uh, nothing from the editor 
And uh, and even though, and this is one point I've been wanting to make that even though the, the HBO stamp is like on the book, HBO had no input into the manuscript or, or no veto power whatsoever, which is a discussion before uh, I, I started writing that uh, hmm. that you know, I just want to license the photos and the use of the mark, but I wanted complete uh, you know editorial uh, autonomy. Um, there is a bunch of stuff that I'm going to be kind of outtakes that I'm going to be rolling out on EW.com in the coming months. And there are a lot of things that, that I, I, you know, you know, I, I, I tell you, I, I don't know if you saw a Cobra Kai season two, but there's a reference in there to Sam killing the white Walker. And they, and they put that in, 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 in the context of, you know, it really just goes to show that anyone could be a hero. And I'm like, Damn it! I should have put Sam killing the White Walker in the, in the, in the book. Yeah, you know, you know. But at the same time, it's like I tried to pick things that were iconic and essential, and or I had really good reporting on. And I will tell you the very last thing I added. I was, you know, they basically had to pry this book out of my out of my hands because I was working on it to the very last minute. I kept trying to polish it and improve it, and it was right up against my deadline. And I was laying there in bed, and I was just like, "Damn it! I'm gonna get the cat in." I want Sir Pounce in the, in the book, and it, it's such a silly you know thing that that kind of took off online. But I had some funny anecdotes about it, and in, in terms of and and so I knew that the, that the reporting was kind of fun. And I was just like, I got to figure out how to get Sir Pounce in. So, you know, literally one of the things I'm least proud of, or or most proud of, you know, depending on how you look at it in the book, <laughs> is, is that chapter. There is no reason for Sir Pounce to be in that chapter. The chapter is about Tyrion. And and his and his journey in season four and how that leads into the trial by combat and and him killing his father and I and I did this like awkward segue of while Tyrion was down in the black cells like up up in, in the tower of the Red Keep you know you know Tommen was with Marjorie and then this and then I so I just kind of. You like just kind of vertically just kind of go up, you know, the stairs and then, then kind of bring it back down again, just so I could segue and get two pages about, you know, trying to deal with this uh, unruly cat on the set in there. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got that in. Yeah, I, I think we are too, because that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then another question is, which cut book characters do you miss, regardless of how small or insignificant they would be, if they were to be brought to the show? You know, I, you know, the it's it's interesting be, be, uh, because, you know, you know, you know, you know even ones like uh, Adrian Mar Martel, you know, they, they kind of made Alaria a sanded into that character. So a lot of the ones that were cut ended up kind of becoming other characters. So so it's so it's interesting to try and think of it in your head because it's like, well, there's this one, but then they kind of use that for this other character. Um, it, look, look, the obvious answer is 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 Lady Stoneheart because that's that's such the 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 the, the big thing that they left off. Um, uh, you know, I that was one of those things that they had talked about off the record, but never on the record. That I was dying to get them to talk about on the record, and then they did. So I was very ha happy to get that for 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 the book. And I think if you go through David and Dan's reasons on that, it's like okay, I can completely logically see that. But at the same time, we don't know the rest of that story yet. You know, there's only been. Uh, two chapters with Lady Stoneheart in in the book so far. So I think that's going to be one of those interesting things that once um, the books end, I think there's going to be a lot of things when the books end where you can kind of, when you finally see the two full pictures that you can judge whether that character should have been in there or or not been in there. Yeah, and we just hopefully don't have to wait too longer to read that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, he's he, you know, he's making. I mean, for, 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 at least for, for, from what he's told me, he's making great progress during the the pandemic on uh, on the book. I would not be at all surprised if the book came out in in uh, in, in next year. But I mean, you know, I mean, I I, I would never make a prediction, <laughs> but 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 it would but it would not surprise me at all, given you know how confident he sounds. Well, speaking of the pandemic, a slightly rough transition. <laughs> But what's speaking it like... of the pandemic, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a drink for, for my dire wolf mug here. Go ahead. Well, one of the attendees would like to know, what's it like to release a book during the pandemic? Well, don't title your book, All Men Must Die, and have that <laughs> title 
as your working title as a pandemic hits, I, I, I would advise I would I would advise against doing that because uh, that was the uh, working title of the book for a very long time. And then you ever see that Simpsons episode where Homer has like the barbecue pig and it starts to like roll down the hill and he starts chasing it going, it's still good, it's still good. And the pig goes in the river and he's going, it's still good, it's still good. That was me with that title as as the months you know rolled on in, in the pandemic. And then you know, we just sort of all came to a collective decision that it's not still good. So um, so uh, that's, that's one thing. And, uh, but the other thing is that you know, it's my first book. It might be my only book. I, I don't know. So I I feel a bit bummed that that I can't sort of go out there and and be at at, at Strand Books and 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 be at at, at at George's bookstore in the uh, in, in in Santa Fe and and sort of you know have that experience of of going around and 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 promoting this like like a you know an author regularly does. So so I I think that's 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 the one uh, you know. Thing, but you know, yeah, I mean, you, I, I, I'm, I'm clearly, I don't want to complain about anything because, uh, because, uh, yeah, because you know, there's so much more to complain about. No, it's true, but it, it is a shift. Like we hear it a lot during events where it's, it's not what anyone expected. Like when yeah. you're publishing a book, this is not, yeah, how you imagined it. Oh, you, oh, you, you know, I, I will say say one thing that was interesting because I really buckled down the writing in you know in last Thanksgiving, and I I just really just decided, okay, I'm just going to stay home and shelter in place, and you know, only go out a couple times a week and have groceries delivered, and just go for walks instead of working out. And I'm basically go going to do that until March when my first draft is due. And after that, then I will let myself go out there and have fun and hang out with friends and rejoin oh. life. And so, you know, you can see the punchline coming to this. You know, I turn in my draft and then all of a sudden the pandemic hits and now I can't go out. So I've been doing, you know, the shelter in place thing here in my, you know, little Austin place uh, for nearly a year now. And I'm, here to tell you all from your collective futures, no, it does not get easier. <laughs> it, it, it really sucks. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so, so, so it was weird to have like that strategy of writing the book kind of roll into, um, it, it, into, uh, the, the, the whole <laughs> sheltering in place of the pandemic. Oh yeah. For it to just become your life for the foreseeable. Yeah. Yeah. No, on a, as a final question, sure. What does Games of Thrones mean to you? Hmm. Wow. I mean, to me, it it was the biggest show of the twenty first century. It, it it changed what TV can be. Um, it's it's a decade of my life, and it was something that I look back on. And you know, all those times I was on the set, I would. I was so focused on the next interview. I mean, this almost sounds like like a deathbed comment, but it's like I was so focused on the next interview. I was so focused on getting material, enough material for EW. I was so focused on getting, you know, figuring out what what's the right question to ask and figuring out what the what was going to happen because no one wanted to tell me spoilers, but I still kind of had to try and figure them out while I was on set. So I was always so stressed out and trying to 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 achieve, basically. And you know, I wish I would have spent more moments just enjoying being there and and, mm -hmm. and you know soaking it in and and really enjoying that 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 moment uh, to be uh, with this show. And you know, and as I talk about in the book, I sort of compare Game of Thrones to Roger Bannister breaking the the the, the four minute mile. You know, it, it is it is something that was supposed to be impossible, and they did it. And now mm -hmm. we're in a world in which. Uh, TV shows don't look different from movies, and and people are spending like these crazy amounts of money on on shows. And there's no longer a limit to what a TV show can portray from somebody's imagination. And, and it used to be that that there were limits to that, and that feels limitless. Oh, that's beautiful. And it seems like the dream for any sort of like entertainment writer to like witness that that new beginning and dawning of an era of TV. Yeah, no, it was it was it was fantastic. I mean, there 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 it was really something. Well, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but we have to pull this to a close. So, 
Uh, first off, thank you so much, James. It was wonderful talking to you. This was a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Your, you know, your questions were great, and uh, you know, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed this, and and I, I want to thank everybody that uh, that watched and and or, or listened or and who are who, who's who's getting the book. Um, you know, it's been a privilege uh, covering the show, and uh, and uh, and you know, I hope hope you enjoyed the read, and uh, thank you.